2019's gone. Christmas apparently is over too. If you go to the stores or anywhere out there, they're already taking everything down, getting ready for Valentine's Day. I think's the next thing coming, right? It seems the longer you live, the shorter each day and the shorter each year becomes. The older and slower you get, the faster time seems to fly by. And I suppose it's because with each day that passes, we become increasingly more aware of how short life really is. We become increasingly more aware of what scripture tells us in James chapter 4. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. As I was driving back from California over the past week, I uh, was only intending to stay in a hotel one night, but uh, as the drive went, I spent two nights in a hotel, uh, and each night I turned on the television to try and de-stress, and uh, I did that by watching the news. Why would you do that? <laughs> <coughs> yeah. And both nights, there were two different specials from two different television stations reporting on the very same topic. And what they talked about was the roller coaster of emotions that seemed to be filling people this time of year. The New Year's blues is what they talked about. The regret, anxiety, depression that is increasingly accompanying the New Year for many, many people. We just celebrated all the joys and the wonders and the peace of Christmas and before there's even time to take the tinsel down, we're faced with the reality that another whole year is gone. Many of the reports I saw and read attributed this depression and regret surrounding this time of year with looking back on a year and seeing resolutions not met, goals not accomplished, mistakes that were made, opportunities lost, so on and so forth. Most of the articles I read and, and heard also talked about the fear of the unknown going into another year, another decade. Anxiety particularly spikes because despite our best intentions and our best resolutions, we're acutely aware inside of how much we don't control, no matter how hard we try. We really don't have as much control over tomorrow as we'd like to think. And then, of course, there's the fact that a new year also means you're a year older, too. What really grabbed my attention, however, as I watched these reports was what one sociologist said he found to be a scary increase in anxiety and what was causing it. He said, never before in the history of humanity have we seen such rampant and uncontrollable change in every aspect of society. Not just in technology, but in public policy. Not only in public policy, but in the very morals and moral imperatives that have stood the test of time for so long are now being changed week by week, day by day. He said that this change is what puts everybody on edge. The beginning of recorded history even with the Industrial Revolution, hasn't seen this level of change. And he said it's a change that even those making the changes can't keep up with. And that's what puts everybody on edge. At the heart of this frantic change, he said, is the ever-increasing fascination we have with what is new. There's a prevailing idea in society that if it's new, it must be, by default, somehow better, more desirable. I notice this personally when I go to the grocery store. I go there looking for the item I always get, packaged the way it's always been packaged. And the one time you go, it's got a whole new look, whole new logo. You don't even know if it's the right thing anymore. And what does it say on the package? New look, same great product. Well, then why change the label? Because it sells, right? They wouldn't do it if it didn't sell. 
even if it just has the appearance of being new, without changing anything of the substance, new sells. And this time of year, I think, myself included, and I assume you, we do have a tendency at the new year to start thinking about what new things we can do, what changes we can make going into the new year that will make our life better, that will make us more happy and satisfied. And God's word certainly does call us to desire higher things. It does call us to always seek to live a full life to the glory of God. Jesus would say, be perfect because your heavenly father is perfect. However, the Bible is also clear that apart from a relationship with God, apart from a relationship with him in his word, We cannot change what Jesus calls us to change. We cannot live the life we want. We cannot live the life he died to give us without a relationship with him in his word. Through his prophet Jeremiah, God proposes a very rhetorical question in chapter 13. He says, can an Ethiopian change his skin? Or a leopard change its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. It's counterintuitive this time of year, but the truth is, despite your resolutions, you ultimately can't change you. But God can. See, in our nature, we hear this all the time, we are sinful in nature. And a naturally sinful being cannot make itself any less sinful. God would say just a few chapters later in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? If we want change, if we want to be made new, if we want new life, if we want to realize everything that the life we have been given has to offer, then we have to turn to the author of that life. His plan, his way, his word. Proverbs 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, to properly understand that verse, you have to understand it's not saying that he's going to give you everything you want. It's saying that he's going to put the right desires in you. See, by nature, we don't even desire the best things. We often think that they're the best things. But when we delight in one person, in one thing. When he is our everything, it says not only will God make you desire the right changes, make you desire and see the good you should pursue, but he will also deliver that to you in his word. James says in chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift. Is that not what we look for in New Year's resolutions? Good and perfect is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change we talked about it in our christmas messages from john first john chapter 4 god is love god is good he is life and god never changes his truth never changes which means that if we're looking For stability, if we're looking for true, eternal, everlasting change to live life, then we must turn to the one with whom there is no change. We must turn not to the new things, but to the old, ancient, eternal things of God. Specifically, the word of God. That word that John tells us in the first chapter of his gospel existed before anything was. That word that spoke everything into existence. That word that took on flesh to die, to give life. That word you have in your hands that still gives life today. 
that word of God that really does change lives, not just for tomorrow, but for eternity. John 3, 16, that famous passage, John chapter 3, 16, tells us how God so loved the world that he gave his word in the flesh to die so that anyone who puts their faith in that word made flesh would live. And then when you turn to another passage, 3, 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, it says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. As the word of God made flesh breathed out his last breath on the cross, that same word breathes life into you and me. There's only ever been one person who didn't need change one person who was perfect, one person who was faithful all the way, Jesus. And as we saw from our text today in Luke chapter 2, even as a young boy at 12 years old, even then he knew where true life and truth could be found. He knew where he belonged. You got to think about this text a little bit from Luke 2 that we read after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished, to say the least, right? And his mother said to him, son, why have you create, uh, treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I don't know about you, but the holiness of Mary and Joseph come through really strongly to me in that passage because of what they did not say to Jesus when they finally found him. I don't know if that would have been the words I used if I didn't see my daughter for three days. Been so gracious. But even more incredible than that is what Jesus says. Why were you looking for me at all? It took you three days. You should have known right where I was. In other words, if you're looking for Jesus, he's right here. There's no better place you could be than in his father's house. Hearing his word in which he is found. And yet, it's a beautiful mystery that still the perfect wisdom of God in the flesh still grew and had to learn as we do. I can't explain it to you, but God in the flesh so quieted and humbled himself in his humanity that the text says twice he grew up learning faith. And if the Lord that we worship said, I must be in my father's house, where should you be? Right where you're at. And not just on Sunday morning. Where should your heart be? Your thoughts be? Your actions be? In the word. Do you want a new and improved life in 2020? If you do a search for that, you'll find 15 steps, 16 steps, 30 steps to a new and improved life in 2020. I got two for you. Go to church. Make it a priority and stay in the word of God every day. They tell you in seminary, don't preach to people in church about going to church. But just because your body is here doesn't necessarily mean you're here. Why do you come here? 
Do you realize who's here? I hope that's why you're here. I hope that as Jesus said, I have to be here. Where else would I be but here? I know this isn't very popular in this day and age to say, but I think that's what you pay me to do. I think this message has to be heard even by those sitting in church. It is the priority. Should you be in church instead of basketball? Should you be in church instead of this? Should you be in church instead of homework? Should you be in church? Yeah. Yes. I'm just going to say it. You have nothing more important Sunday morning than this. And not because I care about how many people are here. I really, honestly, truly don't. I care that you receive what's being offered here every Sunday. What do you think Jesus would have said on your schedule, on your plate? Oh, you know what? That I understand. That's all right. You can miss this Sunday. Nothing. I must be in my Father's house. Those are not my words. Those are the words of my Lord and your Lord. And be in the word of God. We talked about it in Bible study this morning. Do you understand how fortunate you are to have what you have? Do you think Mary would have liked to have written down for her everything about her son and what it means? Do you think the apostles who wrote these would have liked to have had that? We can understand. We can grow in a relationship with our maker through his word given to us. What is coming before that? Whatever your resolutions are, cancel them. Those two things are it. We cannot change ourselves. He changes us. And he does it through his word, through his sacrament, through a life that abides in those two things in his church. God said, Jesus said, praying to God in John 17, just before he went to the cross, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do, I have given them your word. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Jesus prays for you and me. And I can assure you of this much. His plans for your life will blow yours out of the water. You can't even begin to compare or contend with the glory and majesty of what the God of the universe wants to do in you and through you. And we dare to make resolutions for our life. God says, do you understand what I have for you? It's so much bigger than just a bank account. It's so much bigger than a lack of suffering or a lack of this or the presence of this or the presence of that. I want to give you eternal, everlasting joy and life and peace no matter what you go through. I'd like to leave you today with these words from Ephesians chapter 3 that I pray are fulfilled in your life every day. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ever ask or think of, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.